Hello and welcome to Crosstalk, where all things are considered. I'm Peter Lavelle. How bad can it get? How low can Russia-U.S. relations go? At this point, it's anyone's guess. But one thing is for sure, Donald Trump's call for better relations is now dead in the water. Cross-talking Russia-U.S. relations. I'm joined by my guest here in Moscow, Mark Sloboda. He's an international affairs and security analyst. We also have Nikolai Petro. He is a professor of political science at University of Rhode Island. And we have Dmitry Babich. He is a political analyst with Sputnik International. All right, gentlemen, crosstalk rules in effect. That means you can jump in anytime you want. And I always appreciate it. Professor, let me go to you first here. Um, where are we in this relationship right now? We, we talked about this in an earlier edition of uh, Bullhorns. Uh, what does each country want to achieve in this spiraling downward effect? It wants to embarrass the other side. Yeah. That's uh, tit for tat. And it's like two bullies in a schoolyard, I guess. They, they have to keep sniping at each other. So it's a prestige issue right now. <clears throat> More than anything else, particularly on the uh, issue of uh, the expulsion of diplomats and the closing of, of, of these diplomatic missions. The, the interesting question that we were talking about before, uh, before the cameras uh, came on was the issue of rules. Mm -hmm. And um, are there still rules that apply? And I think what we're seeing now is the erosion of rules, which is neither the absence of rules nor clear rules. And the erosion creates a great sense of insecurity among everyone, both participating and observing, because we're seeing holes appear in predictable behavior. Mm -hmm. So anything is possible now, and that's a very frightening situation. Mark, that's a very frightening situation here, because we, it, once you abandon the rules, I mean, I think our viewers have to understand is that there's a certain kind of etiquette that is expected yes. in diplomatic circles, and even the worst rivals yeah. respect those things. You respect the immunity of diplomats. You, res you respect uh, property rights here. All of this has been blown out of the water. It's been and it is not mentioned in Western media that this is happening right it, now. It, it, it hasn't been blown out of the water uh, just recently, or only with Russia even. Look at Julian Assange, trapped right. in the Ecuadorian embassy A in London under, un under siege, right, for years. Um, this... Uh, it's, it's all since 1992 with the unipolar moment. The U.S. political establishment became addicted to not being uh, adhering to the rules. No, the, the American exceptionalism says the U.S. is not bound by the rules of international law or the etiquettes of international diplomacy. And this is, this is only the latest round of this. And also, there's other factors of the game now. I prefer to think of it as a great game. So like going War, back to the 19th right, century, century type 19th thing. The 19th century. That weren't ever established in rules. Cyber warfare. I mean, mm. this is uh, suddenly a, a siren klaxon coming out of the U.S. media. Oh, Russia cyber attacking. The U.S. has been cyber attacking Russia and other countries for years. That's never been reported on. There are no rules established for that. President Putin has asked repeatedly for the U.S. to sit down and negotiate rules for cyber warfare, for economic warfare, for these other things that they're not only you know, we're talking erosion, they're talking new aspects of the game that rules were never created for. Deem it, 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 with this, ex, this latest tit for tat, uh, is Washington <coughs> trying to push the Kremlin into doing something irrational, rash, to make them overreact? Because with this, uh, this environment of no rules, you can, ex you can expect the unexpected. I, don't, I sense that's not going to happen. There will, there will be a reaction, but asymmetrical probably. Well, I mean, right now we have some liberal commentators here in Russia regretting the fact that Putin did not respond in a tit for, for that way immediately. Uh, and obviously these are people just interested in, in, in a deterioration of relations. <coughs> well, if Not uh, only liberals. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, I regret it. <laughs> I agree with the professor that basically there are no rules, but I will just tell very quickly what are uh, the rules that are absent now and that were in place during the Cold War. During the Cold War we had an arms control regime, which is basically dead now, you know. ABM Treaty was uh, destroyed back 
2002. Back in the early 2002. Uh, we, uh, uh, CFE, conventional forces in Europe, doesn't work anymore. Intermediate range nuclear forces. Yeah, you training. know, Russia now is going to have joint exercises with Belarus that is seen as an excuse for dozens of exercises right on Russia's borders, in Estonia, in Romania, in Georgia, everywhere. So basically, uh, and there is another very uh, sinister development. Uh, the U.S. is now targeting the Russian elite. A look at their sanctions war. It says that uh, President Trump and the U.S. government in general should produce every year a report mm. on, the, on the big business in Russia, on the connection of Russian businessmen to the Kremlin, on the incomes of their spouses, their children, their parents, their property abroad. So now the elite is targeted. So this game is not only very dangerous and unpredictable, it is also very okay. undemocratic. It, it, what is the end game? What, 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 do, what do the, the this, this American onslaught, you know, starting in, in, in the end of December, I, I used to onslaught correctly. I mean, there was no evidence. There was no, you know, they, they, they didn't catch a spy. They didn't have any microfilm. They didn't have a hard drive that they caught. I mean, there was no evidence for this here. It was capricious, okay? Mm -hmm. And that evidence has never been shown publicly here. So I think it is very rash here. What, is, what do the U.S., uh, what does the U.S. want in this type of behavior, except for to embarrass and to, sh and to force an overreaction, which historically is not something that comes from the Kremlin. Go ahead. The <clears throat> lack of predictability leads to an inability, an inability to uh, explain these actions rationally. But I would flip the question a little bit, and perhaps we can discuss it from this perspective. Who benefits and who loses? Which side gains more and which side loses more from a continued deterioration? Because the trajectory we see, the, con the trajectory is downward. So who stands to gain, who stands to lose more, Russia or America? I think my immediate assessment is that uh, Russia does not uh, lose as much as the United States overall from a deterioration in relations. The relations are already so bad, right. it doesn't affect our commercial ties, it doesn't affect our diplomatic ties, because all of those, and, and intelligence ties, those are all pretty much been suspended. But a continued deterioration of relations between these two superpowers frightens the Europeans, and it leads to a rift between the United States and Europe, and there, have already, there has already been pushback on that front against a further, what the Germans call, let's not have another ice age, said the German mm -hmm. foreign minister. You know, Mark, I, I, one of the things I've been noticing, and this goes all the way back to the, um, uh, the Ukraine situation in 2014, with the rhetoric that we hear from um, a Western politicians, I don't care what political party, and from Congress, and of course from the media, how do you walk back any of this to improve relations when it's necessary? Or are we looking at, and, and now maybe I'm exaggerating here, or just for the next generation, it's going to be very low level. But it's going to be a, a, a diplomatic cold war. Yeah, there has to be an intention to walk back. That's uh, what I'm getting at. There is, That's no, what I'm getting. there is no such intention. And when Nikolai asks who benefits and who doesn't, he's exactly right. But we can't look at this outside of the prism anymore of uh, d U.S. domestic politics. Agreed. President Trump campaigned and won the election, the, perhaps the only foreign policy platform that was relatively coherent and continually expressed to his own political detriment in the United States, is he wanted detente, he wanted improvement in relations with Russia, and he wanted to end the pursuit of hegemony, regime change, nation building, democracy promotion, all these euphemisms around the world. Um, so. He is now effectively a hostage in the, in the White House. Him and a very small dwindling circle of loyalists who were with him at the, at the beginning uh, during the campaign. Um, where, when we say who benefits, it's not the Trump administration who benefits. They're continually uh, victimized and, and demonized throughout all of this and, 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 and associated with Russia, and thus both are demonized. It is about the deep state. It is about this unelected, uh, continuing um, uh, uh, rule by bureaucrats, technocrats that continue no matter who reigns office. There was just a piece in foreign policy asking, can the deep state and the media survive Trump? And they tried to cast these people that, yeah. as 
paternalistic patriots right. who were protecting the country and, and rather than assaulting democracy with leaks. Kind of like the things. Holy Ghost. Yeah, they, they, they were trying to recast their treason as patriotism. And they said they would follow and obey a reasonable president. They get to decide what is right. reasonable, what isn't. Okay. And anything that deserts from the U.S. Okay. establishment oh, foreign they, policy they could sound is not too, reasonable. Just trust me. I don't, yeah. I don't, I don't like that phrase here. Yeah. You know, Demon, let's turn it again around. Why should the Russians care? If you want, don't want to parlay, then you just say, <laughs> okay, fine. Well, I, I think the professor raised a very important issue. Who is going to lose from this? Well, I would ask the other, other question. Who is going to gain? I think BRICS and China in particular, they now look so more, much more reliable than the United States. Uh, and and, and the, the main loser is the credibility of the United States. I mean, when President Trump now says, I decided to suspend the trade ties with countries that trade with North Korea. What does it mean? Is he going to suspend trade ties with China, which is $650 billion per Germany, year? Germany, India, Absolutely. Israel. <laughs> so th that is a blow to the U.S. reputation, to the credibility of the U.S. foreign policy. If Russia had been such a bad country, you know, it would rejoice. But I don't think so, because no? Russia does not want to defeat or damage the United States. Russia wants to defeat the ideology of re regime change. And that ideology is the same in the United States, in, in, in Western Europe, in Central Europe. I mean, uh, with Julian Assange, after all, this is the UK that is basically keeping him hostage. With, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the situation uh, in the Europe. Swedes lifted. Absolutely. Right, right, right. There's really you know, no cost. The, the, there's right. no charges. Right. One no of the main clients of the EU in the former Soviet Union, Ukraine, is now going to introduce legislation that would make it a criminal offense for the Ukrainian officials to visit Russia, which is like make it a criminal offense for Canadians to visit the United States, you know, or even worse. So you have this ideology, which is the real then, enemy, not the country. This is your favorite card to play here. So Gentlemen, we're going to go to a short break, and after that short break, we'll continue our discussion on Russia-U.S. relations. Okay, let me go back to Nikolai. One of the things that I, you know, I, I ended the first segment here. Why should Russia really care? If, if, if the U.S. doesn't want to parlay in a bilateral relationship, then at a certain amount of, at a certain point, you just say, okay, that's the way it's going to be. But we live in a real world with very real problems. And let's, let's consider North Korea. Um, I think the, that Russia has been, played a very constructive role um, in, the, in the United Nations. A lot of people didn't agree with Russia's position on voting on uh, additional sanctions. Though when they did do that, and China did do that, they had a, uh, a roadmap how to move forward, and a very reasonable one, I would say, at that. Which has been completely it, ignored. Which has been, well, it, it's been, it, ignored is an understatement, okay? I mean, most people don't even know it happened, okay? So, but this is a time when the United States and Russia really, truly need to work together and to resolve this crisis that I think that has been generated from the West that can be a different conversation. But these are two key, for goodness sake, North Korea and Russia border each other. Okay, Russia has a vested interest in resolving this situation here. And with, the, with this tit for tat, this de 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 deterioration of relations, this is the worst possible time for something like this to happen. In the West, there seems to be an assumption that if Russia is somehow marginalized from the international equation, more decisions can be taken. The problem now is that Russia needs to be part of the international order, America needs to be part, and crucially, the relationship between the United States and Russia needs to be a fundamental, is a, is a, has been and continues to be a fundamental cornerstone of the international order. Now when you take that out, the international order collapses, it becomes a free-for-all. Right. And uh, again, it, is, it would be interesting to consider who benefits, uh, cui bono, who benefits from a free-for-all? Because obviously somebody must be thinking that they benefit more from the collapse of all rules and international anarchy than from but, but, any type Nicola, you just of you said arrangement. somebody might be thinking. I don't see a whole lot of thinking out there. Mark, okay, the, another derivative of that, if, if the, if the um, uh, 
let's say the countries of NATO and the United States, um, let's say even Japan, um, ignore Russia, take Russia out of the equation on the international stage. That doesn't stop from Russia and China resolving this issue themselves. Who becomes marginalized then? Yes. It cuts both yes. ways. Go yeah. ahead. That's why I talk about it as a great game with multiple players now, not just... Uh, although it, the U.S. is doing its best to push it that way. The problem when we're talking about international order is that we here and Western commentators and, and theorists talk about two different international orders. We talk about the post-World War II, 1945, UN uh, inter, uh, UN Security Council, UN Charter World of International Order, Sovereignty, Non-Interference in Domestic Affairs. Well, they are talking a liberal world order, sure. as they refer to it, started under uh, Bretton Woods, the creation of the uh, the WTO and, 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 and the, the global free trade regime, and then it came to hyperpower with the collapse of the Soviet Union, the dissolution of the Soviet, self-dissolution of the Soviet Union in 1992, and the emergence of the U.S. as a hyperpower mm -hmm. bestriding the world. Um, so uh, what we're left with in North Korea in specifically is that Russia and China, and neither one of them are f proponents, real proponents of the regime in sure. North Korea. They're giving, it's not a real communist, not that Russia and China are communists anymore, no matter how much Americans like to believe that they are. They certainly don't want a nuclear arms race in They're back in Northeast North. Asia. But Japan, South Korea looking to develop nuclear weapons, they don't <laughs> want it. But they don't want North Korea to collapse um, uh, unilaterally uh, with U.S. military bases running up the North Korean peninsula yeah, and a humanitarian catastrophe. Okay. They want an organic dissolution of North Korea into a united Korea. The U.S. will never allow that to happen on terms that would allow South Korea to emerge with its own sense of geopolitics that might draw it even a little bit closer to China and towards more historical antagonism with Japan. Sure. Mm. You know, you know you, but I see this as a real possibility that Russia and China could be successful in dealing with this situation and who loses okay the reputation of the United States loses and there's a demonstration effect here I mean the the the, the proposals that the Chinese and the Russians have made I think they're almost identical from what I understood from the United Nations Security Council there is a possibility of that happening and if we see that happening you could see the deep state that Mark has already mentioned here, they would want to spoil that. They wouldn't want to make sure that couldn't happen, which brings us back to the same crisis that we started from. Go well, ahead. The problem is that deep state never stops short of anything except complete victory and the destruction of the enemy. Basically, w w what does North Korea want in the first place? Talk to us. Take us seriously. A permanent peace treaty. You used to do it, you know. The, the South Korean presidents met North Korean president just a few years ago. President Kim Tae Jun, you know, the former dissident, met Kim Jong Il, and the sky didn't fall upon the earth. You know, the, the situation indeed improved. But this is the problem. The United States simply doesn't notice the organizations that it does not like. For example, the Eurasian Economic Union, uh, you know, the uniting the former Soviet republics, not the Baltics, not Ukraine, but those which have normal relations with Russia. The Eurasian Economic Union exists. We all already have a free trade zone with Vietnam, but the United States doesn't notice it. CSTO, Collective Security Treaty Organization of the former Soviet Republic, the United States and NATO do not notice it. You mean don't acknowledge it? They do not acknowledge it, and they don't even notice it in the sense that they never comment on any actions of CSTO. Even BRICS, they barely notice, you know. And, and this is... Well, I think they notice it, but they just they, they, they don't want to respect it because it they, violates their sense of they, the world. They don't order. want to okay. legitimize. So, yeah, they want sometimes, to legitimize it. Sometimes okay. I have an impression that uh, the United States, for the first time in many years, is ruled by anti-Hopsians, you know. Hopes uh, warned us that if you don't have... Uh, uh, rules, if you don't have order, which may be cumbersome sometimes, you have a war of everyone against everyone. And this is exactly what we are having now. Mm. Well, you said a cui bono, who profits? Well, we have situations in history when wrong ideologies just created this international disorder and it was a lose-lose situation for everyone. It, it destroyed millions of people, it destroyed billions of dollars in property, and uh, you know, it was not <coughs> anyone's, to anyone's benefit, except ideology. <coughs> but there is a profit motive. Mm -hmm. I recall one of the popular ideologists of early capitalism is Josef Schumpeter, mm. whose great contribution was creative destruction. <laughs> that out of this total
total leveling of the field, uh, new growths, new births come about. If you want and to call that a contribution. Right. <laughs> right. And here's the danger that they're not creating a firewall. It, our intellectual community in the West, it seems, is not creating a reasonable firewall between economics and politics. Because whereas in economics, at least you could argue some potential benefit coming out of the rearrangement of assets and capital, in the case of politics, you're talking about deaths. <laughs> Real deaths. You're talking about human lives being lost and gener future generations being lost forever. I I'm glad the professor raised uh, uh, Schumpeter and his analogies because Schumpeter wrote in one of his books about the collapse of the Roman Empire. The reason why it collapsed was it didn't recognize any legitimate opponents. <coughs> they were all either terrorists, you know, uh, the, 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 the empire has no opponents, only terrorists. Parties. Mm. Parties. You know, uh, the, the, it has no foreign opponents, only crazy regimes, barbarian regimes. It recognizes only itself yes. and its client states. It, it, it recognizes only itself. So when you don't have legitimate opponents, then you collapse simply because nothing can exist without... Well, uh, and before you collapse, <laughs> you become increasingly irrelevant to the political order. Right. That's the danger there. Right. You, uh, the question repeatedly, why does Russia keep trying? Why does Russia keep trying to parlay and improve relations with Russia? It's simple. Russia is the weaker power. Russia is not the Soviet Union. Its geopolitical horizons are muchly reduced. Its ability to project power, its, its economic, its relative military true, strength true. Are, are all much <coughs> reduced. Um, but um, where there is still the possibility of hope for Russia is in alliance or at least partnership with other countries like because China, it's much Iran, and the, 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 the Russian Federation is far more adroit than the Soviet the Union was Union because was it was driven by ideology. ideology. Not driven. In fact, to a fault, it's not driven by ideology. Mm -hmm. Pragmatism and cynicism rule the Kremlin. Now, this is where the U.S. is doing us a favor in the long run. They're pushing Russia, China, Iran, and other countries, but particularly those three together, and in this attempt to isolate Russia, which is only isolating it from the West, which is no longer the whole world. Um, and here in Russia, those of us who uh, you know, don't want to eventually be vassals of uh, U.S. Western hegemony, um, we see this a positive development. We want decoupling well, from I mean, the West. I mean, depending on how... They, I mean, we want this is a very, with China the, and Iran. The, the, the North Korean crisis could... Be, it's, if it's resolved, it could be resolved in a way that a lot of people don't expect. Yeah. Well, I, I think, I'm not sure the Kremlin is run only by pragmatism. Uh, because <laughs> well, I th Mark said uh, pragmatism and cynicism, so the, I think... The, the reason that's ideology, politics, okay? I think the that's reason politics. ideology, it, it, it's the ideology that such different countries as Egypt and China can accept. Look at what happened uh, during the last BRICS summit in Xiaomen. Uh, China uh, invited Egypt, Russia promised to invite Iran, Egypt and Iran are formally enemies. So you know. Shia. Absolutely, they, they are f formally supporting different sides in Yemen, but uh, despite all the differences, despite they all don't the differences. want that global disorder. Right. And, and, and BRICS, despite all the odds, people say, oh, this is an organization dominated by China, 70% of trade is via China. Well, yes, but they still come up with political statements every time. And what do you read in the statements? It's always against regime change, against intervention into the internal affairs of other states. That's an ideology. That's not ideology. That's <laughs> international law. That's no, just law. That ideology that's of international okay, law. 30 seconds, last 30 seconds, Nikolai. <laughs> American soft power used to be considered the source of its strength. That soft power was based in large part on the, its ability to act as a peacemaker around the globe, both a peacemaker and a peace enforcer. Where? Now, well, it, right in the immediate going, aftermath keep, at the early going, part, stage of the Cold seconds, War. Go ahead, keep going. And uh, now it is losing that crucial element, proving to be ineffective both in maintaining uh, international peace or in being a facilitator of international peace, and that is creating space for alternative solutions. Very good point to end on. Thank you, gentlemen. We've run out of time. Many thanks to my guests here in Moscow, and thanks to our viewers for watching us here at RT. See you next time, and remember, crosstalk rules.